Thanks for joining us. Before we get started with the message, I want you to know that we really care about you and what's going on in your life. If you need prayer, please give us a call, send us an email, or connect with us on our app. We'd love to stand with you in prayer. In the Bible, God warns us about getting caught up in cords of sin. The devil gets in your head and convinces you to do the wrong thing, then tells you how horrible of a person you are for doing it. The Holy Spirit is there telling you that God still loves you. He's waiting for you, and all you need to do is repent. Sin only brings condemnation, but the Holy Spirit brings conviction. Let's see what Pastor says about how to avoid Satan's devices. Jesus made several statements concerning sin and temptation. Uh, the Apostle Paul also, and he made this statement in Ephesians. He said, give no place to the devil. Now, I, I want to tell you that there is, you, you do need to give the devil one place, and that is a place in your theology. Right? You need to believe that the devil exists, that he is real, that he is a malevolent, evil, wicked spirit who the Bible says is your enemy, your adversary. 1 Peter 5, verse 8. You see, because so many of us as Christians, we say, well, I love God, God loves me, and we live as if the devil never existed. In fact, the Bible says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. So the last time he fled from you is the last time you resisted him. Now, when is the last time you resisted him? Because I guarantee you that there are people who have been Christians for 10 years and 20 years and have never one time resisted the devil. Huh? So we have to have a place in our theology that acknowledges the devil is a real, wicked, malevolent spirit being. All right? But yet we want him to have no place in our life. Other translations say no opportunity. or Don't give the devil a chance. Don't give him a foothold. Don't make room for him. Now, Jesus said this. He said, the prince of this world is coming. Now, he's talking about Satan. And he says he is the prince of this world or this world system. Right? In 1 John, it says that the whole world is in the sway of the wicked one. In other words, the society that we are living in all right, is controlled by the devil. Now, Jesus said, pray, your kingdom come, all right? But, but right now, there is a kingdom, and the prince of that kingdom is the devil. And that's why, as a Christian, part of the kingdom of God, you should not feel comfortable in this world, all right? We're here, but this is not home. Now, I mean, this world system is not our home. But the king, Jesus, is coming back with his kingdom. All right. And it's going to be right here. Right? So, so we want to recognize that there is this evil, malevolent being, the devil. He is, the Bible says, your adversary. Right? And he controls so much of what is happening in this world that we have today. Again, Jesus calls him the prince of this world. In the Amplified, it says the prince, the evil genius ruler of the world is coming. He has nothing in common with me, and there is nothing in me that belongs to him, and he has no power over me. So where we don't want the devil to have a place or an opportunity is in our life. And for example, it says give no place to the devil, and it's talking about holding unforgiveness against someone. And it says that gives the devil a place. Sin can give devil a place and opportunity in our life. Now, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17 says, If anyone, anyone, it's you, it's me, be in Christ. Now, that li literally, uh, it, it means to be in union with Christ. When you receive Jesus as your Lord, you are put in union with him. His death is your death. His resurrection is your resurrection. And the Bible says in Ephesians, you are seated together with him. You're in union with him, seated together in heavenly places, far above principality, power, might, dominion. 
Now, if anyone is in Christ, in union with Christ, Living Bible says you're a new person on the inside. Now, this is important. Right? Now, so when you receive Jesus, God does something on the inside. You become new on the inside. Your spirit literally is made new. Right? And you get God's life, God's nature on the inside of you, in your spirit. However, your body does not become a Christian when your spirit becomes a Christian. Right? Your body is still a heathen. Your body is crazy. Your body wants to do crazy things. Right? So, literally, you were saved. Your spirit was saved. Right? Your mind or your soul is in a process of being saved. The Bible calls it the renewing of your mind or the changing of the way that you think. Yeah, yeah. Right? In, in uh, James, it's called the salvation of your soul. Your mind is your soul. So your soul is being saved. Your spirit is saved. Your mind is being saved. Right? As you renew it with the Word of God. But your body is not saved. And your body will not be saved until Jesus comes back. Paul said, behold, I show you, tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep or die, but we will all be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. What did he say? He said, corruption will put on incorruption. Mortality will put on immortality. And then will be brought to pass the saying that death is swallowed up in victory. In other words, your body will be changed when Jesus comes back. It will be saved when Jesus comes back. If you're alive, instantly you will be caught up with him and be changed. If you have died, then your body will come up. You say, how God's going to do that? I don't know. He probably just took some little part of you and he's going to clone your body. I don't know what he's going to do. But this is what I know. That the God who said, let there be light, and the universe jumped into existence. Listen, scientists tell us there are more stars in the heavens than there are grains of sand in all of the beaches and all of the deserts of the world. That God said, let there be light. He's not going to have trouble making one of you. Let me just say, no problem at all. So, you were saved, you're being saved, and you will be saved. You were, you are, and you will be. So salvation is past, is present, and it's future, all right? It's all of those. So Paul, because he's got this body, he says, for, I, for, for what I am doing, I don't understand. For what I will to do or I want to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. Now, what, what Paul is saying is this. He's saying that, 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 that my body rises up. Now, I, I think Jeannie will remember this. I, I hope she doesn't. But We were driving down 131, right? minding our own business, driving north. In, 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 in my car, when a car gets in your blind spot, this little mirror has a little light that beep, you know. So we're driving along, and I see that little light beeping. I just kind of Look over that way, and here comes this car. And he, he literally, he is coming right at us sideways. And I swerve over, way over, and that car goes by. He misses us by, by like this much. And I don't know what happened. All of a sudden, I said, why that idiot? He almost hit us. And do you know, and all of a sudden, my, my foot hit the accelerator to the floor. And I start coming around that guy. And Jeannie starts talking to me. I think Jesus was talking too, but I wasn't listening to Jesus. <laughs> I tell you what, there was this beast. It just showed up. <laughs> now, I'm not the only one with the beast. <laughs> You know, the Bible says King Saul, he throws a spear at David, tries to kill him. 
Lot sold out to Sodom. Herod killed all the baby boys around Bethlehem. We have David and Bathsheba, Solomon and Delilah, and Noah gets drunk, and Cain kills Abel, and Peter cuts off the, the ear of the servant of the high priest, and Moses kills an Egyptian when he gets mad. Right? So, so you were saved, you're being saved, and there's part of you that will be saved, but it's not saved yet. In fact, Romans 7.23 says the law of sin abides in your members or in your body, right? And that does not, you don't, that part of you does not get redeemed until Jesus comes back. So in Galatians 2 verse 20, Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. Other translations say Christ took me to the cross with him. It is no longer I that live, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So, so what he's saying is this. He says, what I need to do is that new person that I am, the Spirit of God living down on the inside of me, I need to live out of that. And when I live out of that, he said, I live in a way that pleases God. Now, if, if you ever went to seminary or Bible college, one of the classes that you take is a class called hermeneutics. Now, how many of you know that, that educators always try to put big names on simple principles? Okay. So all that means is how do you interpret the Bible? All right. That's all it means. All right. And if you were to take that class, one of the, one of the first sessions that you would have would be called the principle of first mention, which simply means the first time any subject is mentioned in the Bible, the predominant truths about that subject are right there. So that's why when the Pharisees came to Jesus and said, what about divorce? What did Jesus say? In the beginning, God created them male and female. Right? And they said, yeah, but Moses permitted us to have divorce. And Jesus said, yeah, but in the beginning. Jesus just kept on taking them back to the beginning, all right? Because the principles about that are right there in the beginning. So I want to go all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, right? We find Satan showing up. The Bible calls him the serpent. It said the serpent said to the woman. Now, it's the devil. He's just called a serpent. By the way, in the book of Revelation, he's called the dragon, so somebody's been feeding him. That's all I can say, you know. <laughs> he went from just a snake all the way to a dragon, all right? So he said, the, 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 the woman answered and said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit in the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor touch it, lest you die. And the, the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. You will not surely die. What Satan always tries to do is he tries to attack God's word and tells you it is not true for you. Right? Uh, you get the, whatever the reason. Maybe it's because you live in a modern age. Maybe it's because of how you were mistreated. Maybe it's because the devil's going to tell you you've got some special dispensation and God understands. But it's not wrong for you. And there's going to be no judgment. There's going to be no consequences whatsoever. You will not surely die. For God knows in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. The truth is they were already like God. Right? But what the devil was trying to do was get them more in his image under his dominion. And when the woman saw the tree was good for food, it was pleasant to the eyes, the tree was desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit, she ate, and she also gave to her husband with her. Remember, God always speaks the truth, but the devil will tell you it's not true. And God does not have the right to tell you what to do. You can decide what's right for you. You, you can be your own God. You can go your own way. And you can do whatever you want, and there will never be a consequence. You will not die. There will not be a judgment day. 
And ultimately what, it, what it's, it's going to tell you is, it, you know, you need to do this so you can understand, you can feel, you can experience, you can enjoy. God's holding out on you. You know, you, you do this and you'll be bigger, you'll be better, you'll be smarter, you'll be wiser. Right? It's always a lie. Every time it's a lie. So she gave to her husband with her. Let me just say something here about sin. Right? The people you hang around with have a big effect on you. The people you hang around with have a big effect on you. The first time you smoked, he probably was not alone. The first time you got high, it probably was not alone. The first time you saw a magazine or something you shouldn't have seen, it probably was not alone. Right? The people that we hang around with have a tremendous effect. In fact, when God wants to bless you, one of his ways to bless you is to bring somebody into your life to encourage you in the kingdom of God. And when the devil wants to mess with you, one of the things he does is bring somebody into your life to bring compromise. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 6 that God's wisdom will keep you from certain people. It will keep you from, right? Now, the Bible says least Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Now, literally what the devil will do is he'll come in one ear and tell you to do something, and when you do, he gets in the other ear and tells you how bad you are. Literally. I, I mean, he comes with guilt. He comes with condemnation. Now, conviction is what the Holy Spirit brings. The devil's counterfeit is condemnation. Conviction is when the Spirit of God says to you, what you're doing is wrong. Come back to God. He's waiting for you with open arms, and he loves you. <laughs> condemnation is what the devil comes. But see, the Bible says he's the accuser of the brethren. And he comes to condemn. And he tells you you're no good. God is mad. God will not bless you. God will not use you. God will not listen to your prayers. Right? Your, God is going to get you. He's waiting up in heaven with a big slice of water. And he's just waiting for a chance to whack you. That is condemnation. And that is what the devil comes with. Right? Uh, Lester Summerall was a mentor to, to Jeannie and I. He's since gone to be with the Lord. Pastor of a great church down in South Bend, Indiana. I remember him telling the story of a, he had an appointment and he was in his office and they escorted a woman in in her early 70s, gray hair, very distinguished looking. And he said to her, well, you know, you asked for this appointment. Uh, how can I help you? And she says, well, she says, I committed adultery. And if you knew Lester, you, you, you'd appreciate this. And he said, well, Grandma, tell me about it. <laughs> and... Uh, she said, well, she said, uh, when I was in college, she said, I had an affair with my professor. And uh, he said, well, when did this happen? She says, well, just over 50 years ago. And he says, well, you've gotten saved since then? Yes. You prayed for forgiveness? Yes. And he said, well, then why are you here? She said, because it has bothered me every single day of my life. 50 years. She says, it's bothered me every single day of my life. And he talked to her about justification. By the way, the Bible tells us in the book of Romans that you were raised, or excuse me, he was raised for your justification or when you were justified. In other words, the fact that Jesus has been raised from the dead means that your sin was completely paid for, 100%, right? And the fact that he's raised means you were justified, made just as if I'd never done it. Just as if I'd never done it. <laughs> Hebrews 9, 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works, that you may serve the living God? In other words, when we put our faith in the blood of Jesus, our conscience is cleansed. We no longer look back at our sins, our shortcomings, and our failures and have them condemn us. We look at the blood of Jesus through which we are made right with God, righteous, and justified. That's how we need to see ourselves. The Bible says he's the accuser of the brethren. That's what he'll come and do. He will come to every person 
and he will point out your phone. I like to say he's like a grandma. Right? And now when I say this, what do I mean? How many of you ever seen a grandma with her iPhone? And you say, Grandma, you have any grandkids? And she goes, yes. And she begins to hit. She has got 2,462 pictures. And she's over here. Here he is eating beans. Here he is with spaghetti. Here he is pooping. Here he is taking a bath. Here he is playing with the dog. I mean, she just runs through. She, she just got pictures. All right? Everything that grandchild's ever done. That's what the devil's like with you. He heals all the iPhone. You know, you did this in 19, you know, 1999. You did this in 2004. You did this 2008. You did this 2013. You did this 2017. And he did, you are rotten, miserable. And God is mad. God is upset. But it's a lie. It's a lie. Now, it's not a lie you did what he said you did. <laughs> but it's a lie that he, you are who he says you are. Because you're not God's enemy. You have peace with God. You're part of the family of God. He accepts you. You're redeemed. He's made you the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So I want to talk to you a little bit this morning about his devices. I've got a few different traps up here. I, I had this one open in the green room before him, but I decided to leave it closed for the benefit of my fingers. All right. Now, now this is referred to as a foot trap. All right. Now, what a, what a trapper will do is they, th this end here, you can see there's a large hole, a little chain. You put a stick in the ground, all right? and then you put this, you put it deep. So whatever animal you're after cannot pull that stick out. All right? Then you open up the trap, and nearby you put some delicious morsel that that fox or whatever it is you're trying to trap would like to eat. And when it comes by, what happens is that trap closes on their foot and they cannot escape. Now, now they're trying to escape, but they are held by this chain. And it reminds me of Proverbs chapter 5, which says, His own iniquity entraps the wicked man and he's caught in the cords of his sin. Somebody gives themselves to sin and then they think, I'm just going to get away. But the devil has got you. He's got you. And you keep yanking, but it, you just you can't get away. And you fall back into it again and again and again and again. You know, the devil tells you it's just going to be a one-time thing. But like Norval Hayes said, the problem with sin is that you might like it. You know, your flesh, that unsaved part of you, might like it. Now, I've got another trap here. And I got a little story with this trap today. Okay. Now, this is a live trap. And, and the principle is this. You put a, a morsel that that squirrel or maybe raccoon or something wants to eat, and you put it in the back, and you open the front, but there's a trigger back here. And when they go inside and touch that food or whatever you've got there, it springs the trap, and the back closes and they cannot get out, and you're going to relocate them. Right? In fact, I've got one of these I'm taking up to the farm. Now, let me tell you this story. A couple years ago, we went to Cabela's, and Jeannie blessed my soul. All right? She bought me the best winter hunting outfit that they had. All, right? All Gore-Tex, waterproof, soundproof, so you got your bow when you move. There's no noise. And I had it hanging in, in the garage up, up at the farm. And, and unbeknownst to us, a squirrel climbed up in the sleeve. Right? And then it took all the insulation and ripped it all out, all that Gore-Tex, and made a big nest. All right? And, and then it urinated, and then it defecated, and then it died and mummified. All right? So, so last week, I'm ready for, for that hunting thing, and I reach, uh, Jeannie, Jeannie reached up there first, and she's, ah! You know? And she, she makes me come, and it's, it's a little mummified squirrel, you know? It literally was mummified, all right? And so she pulled all that insulation out, and she washed it twice, and she's trying to repair it and fix it. And I, literally, I get 30 feet away, and I can smell that thing. It's just like, ooh. So I'm planning to catch some squirrels. 
and relocate them about three miles away. All right? So let me tell you what the devil does. All right? He, he, he literally wants to relocate you. All right? Uh-huh. He wants to catch you in a trap. All right? And, and by doing it, what he plans to do is he plans to relocate you out of the church, out of a small group, out of right relationships, and he wants to take you and put you in some relationships that are going to be compromised in sin and wickedness and literally pull you out from God's plan and purpose for your life. Relocation. Now, I love this one. I've got my pumpkin. All right. Now, this could make a couple good pies. That's a big one. So the Native Americans would use pumpkins when they wanted to catch ducks and geese. Now, here's what they would do. They'd hollow it out, but keep the top part open where, where water could not get in. And they would put a pumpkin in a stream or a river. Right? And when that pumpkin would go down the stream or the river, the ducks and the geese would see it, and they'd fly away. And then they'd send another one down, and they'd fly away. And then they'd send another one down, and this time they'd only move over a little bit because they're getting used to it. Right? And then they send a couple more down, and finally the ducks or the geese, they get used to it. Right? And then what they do is they cut the bottom out, and they put it over their head and put eye holes in it. And they just come right along and grab that duck or the goose by their feet and pull them down and drown them. Pretty smart. Pretty smart. Here's the principle. You just get used to things. You just get used to things. You know, the Bible tells us about Lot who's Abraham's nephew, it says that he went pitching his tent towards Sodom, the most wicked city on the planet at those, in those days. Now, he started out, he didn't want to have, he didn't want to be too close. He didn't want to have his family exposed to that. Right? But after a while, it just didn't seem so bad. And he moved a little closer. And then it didn't seem quite so bad, and he moved a little closer. And then it didn't seem quite so bad, and he moved a little closer. And finally, the Bible says he's living in Sodom. He sits in the gates with the elders of the city. Now, it didn't happen in a day, and it didn't happen in a month, and it probably didn't even happen in a year. Do you know the devil does not have a 10-day plan to take you out? The devil's got a 30-year plan to take you out. Right? And, and, and he wants you to just become a little bit more comfortable with something that you know isn't right, with something ungodly. And you just get a little closer, a little closer, a little closer. In fact, the Bible says that we, that we literally, we grow in wickedness. Let's, let me read it to you. You put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to deceitful lusts. In other words, your flesh does not get holier. If you will let it, it will become more and more corrupt. What your flesh will do is it will get accustomed to ungodly things that once bothered you, and they won't bother you anymore. Right? And finally, you find yourself like Lot, where you should never, ever be. Ooh, compromise. And, of course, we've got the traditional fishing pole where the devil puts something on the end that he thinks you're going to like. And he's just out there, just kind of dangling that thing right in front of you, Jim. All right? And he tells you how good that looks. Ooh, does that look? That fish sees that. He thinks, ooh, that's a good meal. But he doesn't know there's a big old hook in that thing. All right? And when, when, when that fish grabs hold... He doesn't realize he's caught, right? And literally, that's what the devil does. He comes along, all right, and he hooks you. You got Barbie right there, baby. <laughs> Put that Barbie right there. Look at that Barbie. She's a cutie. I think she likes you. 
We got a kin around here. You know, I've wanted a kin too, but I don't have two hooks. It could be a Barbie. It could be a kin. Look at that. Ooh, look at that on the internet. Look at that Barbie there. Come on. Come on. Take a look. Take a look. You know, devil, he's going to find something. Now, the interesting thing is the Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 12, it says the sin that does so easily beset us. In other words, it's not the same for everybody. Maybe for one, it's Barbie. But for the other one, it's a Benjamin. Look at that Benjamin there. Oh, he, look at he's going for it. You just, you just get it right there. They're after that Benjamin. Whoa, he got it. Whoa. He got it off the hook this time, but next time, we're going to hook him. We'll hook him next time. All right? See, so, so it's not the same for every person. But for everybody, there's an area, right? In fact, listen, this is what the Bible tells us. It says that he laid on him the iniquity of us all. In other words, everybody, us all, were bent in some way towards something that's not right. For somebody, it might be money. For somebody else, it might be pride. For somebody else, it might be food. For somebody else, it might be drugs or alcohol. For somebody else, it might be an illicit sexual relationship. But everybody's bent somehow. Everybody's bent, right? And that's why we need to live out of that inner man, right? In fact, the Bible tells us <clears throat> back in, in Galatians, it says, I say to you, walk in the Spirit out of here, and you will not fulfill the lust of the, fr- of the flesh. Somebody said that that beast is on the inside, right? And it's true, right? But there's also the life and the nature of God on the inside. You say, who's going to win the battle? The one you feed. The one you feed is going to win that battle. You feed the flesh. And the Bible says of the flesh, you will reap corruption. Right? But you feed the spirit. And you'll reap everlasting life. The life of God. Today. His kingdom. Today. Forever? Yes. But today. Right? We need to live out of that inner man and we need to feed that inner man. Say, I want to thank you for being with us today, but I want to ask you, do you know that you're right with God? The Bible says know that you have everlasting life. In other words, we're supposed to know that we're forgiven, know we're right with God, know we're on our way to heaven. And if we don't know, we're not where we should be. And if you don't know today, I want to ask you to bow your head and to pray this prayer with me. I want you to make these words your own. Just say, oh God, I believe Jesus died on the cross. I believe his blood paid for my sins, and I believe he rose again. And today I give him all of my heart and all of my life. I'm going to live for him every day. And I thank you. You've heard my prayer, that I'm forgiven, that my past is gone, that I'm a part of your kingdom today and forever. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, if you prayed that prayer, God heard your prayer, and you are right with God. But we need to keep growing spiritually. And so I wrote a book that I want to send you absolutely free of charge, full of bullet points to help you keep growing spiritually. All the information is right there on your screen. You can download it absolutely free. If you need a hard copy, let us know. We'll send you a hard copy. Thank you so much for being with us today. We pray for you daily. We love you and God bless. If you just prayed that prayer with Pastor Dwayne, you are making one of the best decisions of your life. We're so happy for you. To receive a copy of Pastor's free book, you can go to walkingbyfaith.tv and request a copy of this book be mailed to you, or you can download it right there instantly. Either way, it's absolutely free. While online, you can purchase a copy of today's message, Satan's Devices, in the WVF store. You can also download the scriptures for this message under the On Demand page. We'd love to hear how God is using Walking by Faith in your life. You can connect with us on Facebook or send an email to your story at walkingbyfaith.tv. Next week, we'll be finishing up Soul Destroyer. Until then, have a great week.